So our final presentation before our lunch break, and I don't know about you, but I'm getting hungry, comes to us from co-presenters, Ms. Aditi Garg and Dr. David J. Parkinson, who will discuss collaborative learning internationally. During the session, the chat function will be open to everyone. You're welcome to put your questions or comments in the chat. Be sure, as always, to select everyone as the recipient in the drop-down menu. Ms. Aditi Garg is an educational development specialist with the University of Saskatchewan's Gwena Moss Center for Teacher, Teaching and Learning. With a background in mathematics, outdoor education, and French secondary education, Ms. Garg specializes in assessment, inclusive and responsive learning, and education for sustainable development. In the past, she's consulted the Saskatchewan Ministry of Education on curriculum development, resource evaluation, and exam validation. She also helps instructors with curricular alignment and the internationalization of teaching and learning through her role at Gwena Moss. Dr. David J. Parkinson, is a professor, professor of English at the University of Saskatchewan's College of Arts and Science. He'll be retiring at the end of this academic year. Congratulations, Professor Parkinson. Returning to regular faculty duties after the completion of an administration term, he was encouraged to participate in teaching initiatives, connecting the university's first year courses with counterparts in China, India, the UK, Spain, Ethiopia, Nigeria, and the United States. It sounds like um, uh, he has his hands full. Guided by Ms. Garg, Dr. Parkinson now participates in Collaborative Online International Learning, or COIL, in a project connecting undergraduate courses at the University of Saskatchewan and CEU San Pablo University of Madrid. Thanks for joining us at PAW today. We look forward to your presentation. For that introduction, I'm just going to take a moment here to share my screen. Um, and David and I are so glad to be here to be able to share some of our our uh, experiences about Coil. Um, and I've, there are subtitles, but I apologize if they are a little wonky. They are automatically created, so um, just take it as it comes. So thanks for having us. Um, the question that we're hoping to answer today is. Um, how might we bring valuable international experience and connection into the classroom? So it was very interesting hearing Livia's talk just now and thinking about, well, when students can't go abroad or we can't bring the students here, how can we still give them some sense of the skills and knowledge that they might need to work internationally if they can't go abroad until they're graduated? So the area that I focus on is related to SGG4, goal 4.7 or target 4.7, thinking about global citizenship and appreciation of cultural diversity as um, an element of sustainable development. And then mainstreaming it. How do we now then make the ideas of international experience in policy, curricula, teacher education, student assessment? Right now, we're really focusing on curricula, how do we get it into courses? And then the next step, I think, is going to be into policy and into university culture. Um, so that's the area that we're going to be talking to. And I do want to use the chat, as was mentioned. So I have a little exercise where you're going to type into the chat, but don't hit enter, don't send until I tell you. So I just was curious to know, where are you coming from today? I'm currently on Treaty 6 territory, homeland of the Métis here in Saskatoon by the South Saskatchewan River. Where are you coming from? So type into the chat. I'll give you a few seconds. And I'm on the count of three. I'm going to say three, two, one, and then you're going to hit enter. Three, two, one. Wow. Okay, cool. So we've got many different countries here. I see Ghana. I see Dakota homelands. Treaty 6. Toronto, Mexico, so many different areas. So we are collectively gathering to learn and experience something in real time. Why did we choose that? We could have had a YouTube video of Olivia, but we didn't. We had her live because we wanted to engage or there was a reason why we wanted to gather. Interesting. Okay, so question. Again, to either type yes or no, don't hit enter. Do you work with partners internationally? You need less time for this, three, two, one, go. Yes, okay. Do you have to navigate cultural difference in your work relationships? So again, type your answer out, don't hit enter. Oh, we might be hitting enter already. Okay, three, two, one, enter if you have it, if you were listening. Yes, oh yes. I like that there was an oh yes. Okay, very nice. So navigating cultural difference, that's a thing, got it. 
Do your international colleagues have different ways of knowing your expectations? Either right, yes or no. I'll give you three seconds to think about that. All right, three, two, one, enter. Oh, there was one no, interesting, but a lot of yeses. Okay, so sometimes international colleagues have different ways of learning and knowing. So we have to be able to think about what our students might also need to learn about those. Here at the U of S, um, I'd like you to think about or even in your context, in your country, wherever you are, whichever institutions you work for, if you are in a teaching role, when you work with students, what do you want them to be able to do once they leave, to be able to work towards that, to, to understand difference, to work with difference? Type your answer in. Don't hit enter. I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it. A couple ideas is one idea. That's all I'm looking for. Okay, three, two, one, enter. Equity, yeah, understand difference, actionable deliverables, okay, to be able to act on or produce something. Being brave, <laughs> creative thinking. Thank you, David. Awesome. So there are some interesting ideas. Here at the U of S, we have a skill set as well that we call the learning pursuits that uh, we would like our graduates to be able to have once they leave the U of S. And there's a wide variety. And in particular, I will pare this down to just international experiences. So when we think about experiences that students would have that involve international or intercultural experiences, we think about these elements. And I personally like to think that COIL is a great way of doing that. So what is this COIL? Collaborative Online International Learning. It's based in a course. An instructor works with an instructor in a different country to think about how their students might have a learning objective in common how they're going to create a task or an activity for those students to do together, and then have students reflect on that experience. And there's some pros and cons to that. It does take work, it does take effort. It's an extra other thing that you're adding into your classroom experience. And my colleague David has a lot of experience in this area. So I'm really excited to hear from him about how he's moved from thinking about um, undergraduate research to collaborative research internationally. So David, what did you, um, what were your experiences moving from FIRE, which I've given a quick description here, so you don't have to go over that. Um, so undergraduate research into collaborative teaching. Well, if we're thinking about um, undergraduate research, we're thinking about uh, uh, projects which are located specifically within the curriculum of individual courses. Uh, so we can have uh, projects that are uh, very much aligned um, with um, core assignments uh, within courses. If we're thinking about international collaborative teaching, uh, we're thinking about creating occasions within the course uh, where there's the opportunity for two courses really to mesh, to merge. Uh, I, and I think that that sense of the occasion uh, uh, really uh, gave rise uh, to further thinking about uh, bringing students to the center uh, of the of the special occasion, the 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 merged occasion between different institutions, and this is what led uh, to World Class Day. Uh, this is why I'm especially interested in Coil because I think we are able to capture through this initiative. The sense of the occasion, the excitement, the intensity uh, that uh, students uh, uh, experience and in fact contribute to. And we also find ways of reintegrating uh, this activity, this experience back into our core curriculum. Very exciting initiative, I believe. Thanks, David. I'm actually going to go back a slide and ask you, and you this is now, you've, you've been an expert in setting up undergraduate research at the university in a class, then you did undergraduate research outside of the class. Um, what's it like now doing undergraduate research with a partner internationally? Um, it's, um, it's a lifetime experience for me. Uh, uh, as, as, as an uh, university uh, lecturer, um, because um, the work, and yes, there is work, of merging the two courses in terms of their key principles really draws me back to the emphasis 
on imparting, sharing, and getting students to experience method directly. How do we go about solving problems? So I have to move a little bit away from my comfort zone of delivering curricular blocks of information. And I have to already at the first year level be bringing students directly into the work of learning how to do research. It does take some vulnerability from your end as an instructor and on the part of the students because you're putting them into that more vulnerable situation. So thank you for acknowledging that. And you did acknowledge that it is more work and it takes a bit more time um, to prepare. And I think what was interesting from, from your experience, I'll give some context, you're doing a COIL partnership between English literature and digital production that involves podcasts, a course in Spain that involves um, media production. So yeah. trying to find that common ground, I was so fascinated to how you and your partner, Sara, found the common idea of narrative. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, of course, uh, narrative is where I'm coming from. Um, communication and communication to wider and wider audiences is where Sarah's uh, students are taking this idea. So why don't we think about narrative itself as a way of conducting research? We turn the research into a narrative process. And this finds for us a uh, an inception, it finds for us an icebreaker activity. And then having done the icebreaker activity, we can apply what we've learned to the experience of designing a new research project, a project which is based on a concept that the students at CEU San Pablo will have developed in preparation for that session. I think there's a really nice idea of interconnection there, that you, the U of S students would not be able to do their task unless they met the uh, San Pablo students, and the San Pablo students won't be able to do the next step without having that piece from the U of S students. So I think that yeah. there's some good, sorry. You have it exactly, I was just agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And actually, there's a quote from you. This is from a talk you gave, uh, I believe, at a Chinese institution a little while ago. But I, I liked it and I pulled it out and put it in my own slides because I thought students need to learn how to ask questions. And that was such a good idea here. How do you go about doing this through COIL? How does COIL allow your students to develop questions? Well, uh, the, the approach uh, that led to uh, the statement that you've quoted uh, is from uh, an important, uh, 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 now in its, I think, fifth uh, edition um, uh, handbook, uh, The Craft of Research uh, by Wayne C. Booth and uh, various others. Um, the, the point here is that we are faced constantly at university as researchers with moving from the comfort zone of our particular research community to a wider community and demonstrating to that community why our research matters. I was looking at the Star Phoenix this morning, and this is exactly what uh, Volker Gertz uh, with uh, Vito Intervac is doing, is demonstrating to the widest community why the research at Vito Intervac matters to that community at, at large. What will this community lose if we do not understand and we do not support the research that is going on there. So this is the work that the students are learning to do. Uh, and we, we establish a, a fairly uh, you know, clear process for the students to go through so that they are establishing key facts based on prior research. They're using logical methods to identify 
both the cohesiveness of those previous reports and the places in which that cohesiveness breaks down. We're working with students to, so that they can understand what it is to establish their own credibility within a research, research discourse. And then most importantly, we're getting them to understand that research communication must evolve as we move from one audience to another. So the idea of context, the idea of verification and argumentation, the idea of credibility leading to the idea of context. That, in a nutshell, is the process of developing good questions already by first year students. There are some interesting ideas I'd like to summarize there and add a pedagogy or andragogy perspective from the teaching side. Um, the idea of putting your, giving your students the series of steps or tasks that really required of them. I like how you're giving them a structure. You're saying, here's the zone that you're going to work within. You call it the zone of proximal development, right? So you're saying, what do I know that you're going to need from me in terms of supports to be able to scaffold and grow to the next level? So you are being the more knowledgeable other, as we say it, to say, look, I have some experience with international collaboration. I'm going to give you some tasks or some um, an objective to work towards, and here's the structure that you're going to need for that. And that context, that idea of telling students that you're going to develop a research question, you're going to be responsible for this, and you're going to have to think about how you're going to communicate it to someone in a different context, helps them at a cognitive level because you're relating it to other prior experiences they've had. So making those connections for them to say your question should be important to you or to your audience is helping them think about framing it in their brain. And that information will stay in their brain longer. That's what cognitive science tells us, that if we make connections to another experience uh, or make it relatable, it will stick in their brains more than just one item. Um, if you throw a point out and it doesn't really connect to anything else, they will lose it faster. So I think that's really interesting from a teaching perspective as well. Now, I do think, you know, you did talk earlier about having to be open to these new ideas and expressing vulnerability. You also need to be willing to be ambitious in your teaching. So what you're showing is that we're having to um, show students that we are willing to be ambitious and that there might be hurdles and flaws, but we are going to try something and, and take new initiatives. So thank you for modeling that for our students. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to also mention that, you know, now is a time when we can't go abroad, when we can't take students on study abroads um, or teach abroads, um, but we still want to give them that global flavor. And, and COIL is a way to do that um, because we know, um, as other speakers have mentioned today, that when we take students abroad, they do develop those intangible skills. So is there a way that you see um, programs like uh, COIL helping students get that critical lens when we have to do it from home. That's uh, a very, very important and uh, a very important question that requires me to do some fairly intense and rapid thinking. Okay. Uh, the, the key to the students achieving uh, a meaningful experience online, which is truly intercultural and which is truly international, it seems to me comes in that moment of collaborative work, which has to happen synchronously. It has to happen in real time. And yes, it's a challenge, and yes, it's a critical moment. But if the students are properly, as you've said, step by step prepared for that moment, if the icebreaker has already happened, then it seems to me we're ready for the students to really step forward and achieve something which is truly original and which has a very, very high potential for creativity. Yep, and that, and if we, we're not trying to say, you know, we're not trying to baby students, but we're trying to say, here's a series of steps that will take you towards a new experience. And we know that when students do go abroad, 
they do often go through an experience where um, they have a cultural shock because they're not used to being surrounded or working with with cultural difference um, when you're you're part of a part of the, the norm or the, the collective so helping them prepare for that um, I think is really valuable this could be a stepping stone towards future um, engagement internationally and the nice thing is you can do it from your comfort of the from, from the comfort of your home um, right now through online learning um, which leads me to my next point is that we do think that coil is designed for online because there is familiarity with tech already with online learning and um, it's a if students are working collaboratively in your class already with students at the U of S this is simply another layer where they would now be working with students from a different university. And independent tasks can be hard to track, like you were saying, that if they're doing them asynchronously and they have, I know your group's gonna have Word docs that they're working on independently, and then there's going to be live times when they get together to talk about what they put in the Word doc. Um, so, you know, we just have to find ways to manage that, like we did with Fall Remote 2020. Um, there was a student who did a COIL project in another instructor's course, Martin Gall's course, um, and she actually was like, oh, I, would, I hope that there's COIL in non-online courses. <laughs> so I thought that was really interesting. She assumed it was only for online courses. So that was an interesting point. I, I do want to leave some time for uh, questions. So um, I think what I'll do is I'll just put up the next slide about the steps about how COIL happens at the U of S. Um, so what we offer through our, um, in, through the Guatemala Center and um, and one, you, we do have funding for instructors, but we might also be announcing funding for student scholarships that are in the works. So that's an exciting um, step. But if there are questions, I'd love to address those now um, before we close up in the next uh, five minutes or so. So you can feel free to type your questions into the chat. Aditi, can I just add one point while people are thinking about that? Very quickly, we have an international community in our classes right now this year. So, for example, teaching first year English, I'm teaching uh, to students in nine countries around the world. If we have a COIL experience in the context of this already richly internationalized and, I would argue, prominently indigenized, learning community, we begin to hear different voices from within our classroom. That is a very um, astute observation that our students are not all here and are not all from here. And what here is, is to be discussed in the class. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where the richness of those conversations and the way that you've structured your activity with the icebreaker and then starting to build relation before they go into the task will be very meaningful. Students need to know who they are and who the other is um, and that they are all together. Yes. And not other. So, yeah, that's a great point. Um, I thought I'd mention too that this isn't something unique to the U of S. COIL started off at SUNY University as the, the idea of the name COIL Collaborative Online International Learning, but other institutions call it virtual um, exchange. Um, we've had collaborations with Florida International, currently with CEU Madrid and Universidad de La Sabana in Colombia. Um, and, I, and we do have partners um, at other universities that uh, we collaborate with or, or, um, or talk about COIL with. And it was great to hear yesterday from Tech de Monterrey um, because I work with them as well in developing COIL. So it's nice to see that we have partners. And York U is an, an example of what they call it um, Global Learning Network. So. And if you already have existing relationships with partners in research, please consider working with them in your teaching career as well. So in your teaching life, if there's a good connection to your courses, um, I'd love to help you explore that and think about how it can be built. COIL likes to be the rebel. We don't uh, necessarily wait for memorandums of understanding. We make agreement between instructors, not institutions to start. So we're here to support you. I'm here to support you, at least through the Guatemala Center. Aditi, there is a question from, uh, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this, Mariam Vatan Parast. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's a very interesting one. Um, so if we're thinking about international students and access to academic opportunities, 
uh, at Canadian universities. And if we're thinking about um, funding for these opportunities, we need very often, and especially with regards to postgraduate programs, we need very often to be thinking about uh, prospective supervisors and connections between uh, supervisors' uh, own research uh, uh, programs and the potential for um, uh, training uh, new postgraduate students from elsewhere in the world. This requires a degree of getting familiar, of getting acquainted. And if we have intensive coil, we have a wonderful road already ready for us uh, to be strengthening these connections for researcher supervisors at a university like the University of Saskatchewan with highly qualified talented students around the world. Uh, so by engaging with them with, within COIL, we get to know about their skills and their interests. And David, you're a great case study of that because, you know, I mentioned that we have professional development funding and student assistantship funding, and David has hired three global learning facilitators. So because he's in his last year, he didn't really feel the need to buy more books. So he used his professional development fund to uh, pay for more, grad, more alloc allocated more of it towards the um, global learning facilitators, which is what we call our student assistants. Um, so he was able to support three graduate students, um, and they are going to be developing teaching skills, uh, facilitation skills, mentorship skills through COIL. Um, so it's a way for him to connect graduate students into an undergraduate um, experience here. Most COIL experiences tend to be undergraduate. It's easier to find partners in that way, but that's not to say it has to be. Um, we could um, explore options to connect graduate courses as well. There was a question in the chat that I saw about connecting research projects or thesis requirements. Absolutely. If there's a course where students can work more intimately and over a longer period of time, that would build a very rich collaboration um, okay. collaborative experience, but they do need to be invested for the whole term then, which might yes. be a question. David, did you, have, did you have a comment on that? Uh, I, I, I'm just agreeing very, very strongly with that. I think it's a very exciting notion. I'm, I'm also conscious of uh, our time passing, and we've got three really amazing questions uh, that we still need to address. Uh, from uh, Shirley Zhou, uh, I do want to notice that, uh, just a moment, where is it? The biggest challenge. Yes, because you didn't know Sarah before this. No, no. The, how, how many months before did you meet Sarah? I'm just going to, I want to make sure people know about that. How much, how many months before your course did you meet? Um, we started talking in November uh, for the course that was to begin uh, now. Okay. In, in some kind of serious way. So, you know, six weeks. The biggest challenge is 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 evolution it's learning to evolve with the opportunity as the opportunity is changing it does um challenge an old guy like me to be a lot more flexible and a lot more um creative than i might otherwise be in my teaching Yes, and I have to say, I am. I admire that you were doing this in your last semester of teaching, that you said, this is the term that I'm going to try something new. You've really shown me that over the last few years, how creative you are and willing to take on um, new ideas. So, and, and see them through, that you think deeply about the plan and, and working on it long term. And I think that, surely, to address your question as well, is that there needs to be commitment from both participants. Yeah. Um, from both instructors to say we want to find common ground. Sarah and and David were even talking this week and figuring out, okay, can we even refine this a little bit more? Can we find where this is going to be the best fit? So willing to be flexible there. And Nicole, to your question, that is a great um, point that you make about students' thoughts on COIL. I've had 
at least a handful of requests now from students who say, is there a list somewhere? Can I find how, where the courses for COIL are? Um, and there's probably students who want that list so that they can not register for those courses, for sure. Um, it's a really tough thing. We struggle with that in many areas of teaching and learning. How do you tag and identify experiential learning? How do you tag and identify courses that um, the instructor maybe uses different teaching strategies, but another instructor in the same course title might not, right? So how do you tag those courses in a meaningful way is um, very difficult at an institutional level. Uh, but yes, we have done student testimonials and there is a pre and post survey that we've designed into COIL that David's students will do, other students doing COIL projects are going to do at the start and at the end. And my colleague Chantal Hansen, who I see is in the room, um, also developed some intercultural learning modules for students to have those moments of reflection about their about communication. Um, and those are available through Canvas, in our, which is our learning management system at the U of S. So we are planning on ways for uh, students to um, think about the benefits or the merits of COIL or, or you know, if they have negative experiences with through international mm -hmm. collaboration as well. I'll address Aaron's question because it is important with the, S the SDGs. I see SDGs as a common language. I see them as a way for us to find that common ground around campus, uh, sorry, around the world with other universities. And um, the SDGs is a tool that I would encourage all instructors to think about when they're planning their course design. And I'm, <laughs> thanks, Aaron, for the prompt. Uh, I am actually teaching a course on Thursday and Friday after Paul wraps up, um, but in alignment with Paul, all about putting the SDGs into your classwork. So if you're looking at your learning objectives and you're looking at the SDGs and you're trying to say, I work towards this goal and this indicator, please come to my short course. You can register on our website uh, through uh, find the Guanamas Center events page. So there's my little pitch. But um, we're thinking about what, what should students be able to work towards or feel like they are taking action towards in your course. That's your SDG that you're working towards. Maybe you find a partner in another country who also wants to work towards that SDG or wants students to feel like they're taking action towards it or a uh, solution um, towards that SDG. So that's where I would see the benefit of using the SDGs as common language. Um, and coming back to building those transversal skills for students and helping them um, be the graduates the world needs, right? The U of S, be what the world needs. That's what we go off of. So help them be that. David, any final thoughts? Uh, I think it's really fascinating that we're uh, getting uh, indications from uh, some of the audience members about the uh, the desire to intensify our outreach through uh uh, initiatives like COIL. We have a, a graduate student in Ghana, uh, Alfred Adubobi, uh, who's really interested uh, in, in, joining, in joining in this activity. And I, I think, uh, again, we need to be thinking seriously about how COIL can actually uh, strengthen uh, a, a university's uh, engagement uh, with qualified and talented students worldwide. How do we uh, achieve the kind of support uh, that will uh, uh, really intensify our research uh, initiatives uh, across many disciplines? Yeah, let's leverage that potential. Thank you for sharing that, David, and thank you everyone for your time and questions. We appreciate it.